let's make a start now on what I hope is going to be the a session that tackles probably the most fundamental issue in the UK premium rate market, which is, is it now safe to return to using affiliate marketing in the UK after the issues of last year, the 10 emergency procedures, the £250,000 worth of fines, and from our experience of monitoring affiliate activity, a substantial reduction in the use of affiliate networks. So from my perspective, it's uh, the big question is, is it safe to return, and how to make it safe enough to start to use affiliate networks again? So let's first of all introduce the panel. My name is Jeremy Flynn from Impello. We specialize in compliance monitoring with a particular focus on monitoring affiliate consumer journeys. But yeah, so I'm Bart, I'm from Playbay, and we're working in the UK together with affiliates. So we're going to talk a bit about what's our opinion uh, during this next hour. Uh, I'm Mark Collins, I'm head of regulatory development at Bay Plus, the regulator. So uh, obviously I'm here to discuss what we've been doing and kind of how we can get affiliate marketing back into the UK safely and compliantly. I'm Johnny Brown from SP7 Mobile. Uh, we've been promoting online for about six, seven years now. Um, and both co-reg and affiliate marketing. I'm Brian Gilson from Zamino. We're an aggregator in the uh, in UK and Ireland. Uh, we've run some direct consumer uh, stuff ourselves, and we have uh, B2B clients as well. Um, we've been using affiliates kind of consistently now for the last three years. And uh, I'm the, uh, the co-chair of the digital marketing working group with uh, with Eric. Uh, and I'm Eric Felton from Safari Mobile. Um, we started out kind of as an L2. Uh, we're much more of an L1 now, so we have a range of clients who are using um, affiliate marketing uh, to promote a range of products. And with uh, Bryn, through the Digital Marketing Working Group, um, we kind of helped chair the development of the AIM guidance. So where we're going to structure this morning or this afternoon is Bryn and Eric are going to take us through, for those that are not familiar with the detail of the AIM Best Practice Guide, which is one of the outcomes from the uh, issues of last year. Then we're going to ask Mark to respond as a regulator to its views on the AIM Best Practice Guide. And then we'll open it up more for discussions to, to pick Bart and John's view, brains on what they're doing to make it safe and open it up into a general discussion, if that makes sense to everybody. So, Eric, do you want to take, with Brian, take people through sure. the best practice? Um, so. Uh, the Digital Marketing Working Group, probably starting in about March, started drafting a document together, um, met a few times. PPP's position on it is that it's good guidance, but it's industry rather than phone pay plus guidance. Um, therefore, it's voluntary. You don't have to follow it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee a way of operating compliantly within the 12th code or soon the 13th code. Um, but they did say it is likely to, be, to have a positive effect on a provider's ability to meet its regulatory obligations. So... Um, industry has come together and gotten guidance, it's not best practice, um, and it should help um, you with uh, uh, handle affiliate marketing, but it's not a, uh, a get-out-of-jail-free card by any means. So the guidance for L2s, uh, I would assume everybody knows the L1, L2 split, uh, L1s being aggregators, L2s being responsible for the promotion, uh, which is uh, uh, and the other aspects of the service. So fundamentally, the guidance for L2s is you should know who your digital marketing partners are. You should be clear in the contracts as far as uh, what you want, what you don't want. Um, you should actively be looking for digital marketing issues uh, out there in the wild. Um, you should clean up any messes that get made by affiliates. Um, and you should share intelligence with others. So those are kind of the five principles to it. As far as knowing your partners, uh, you perform due diligence on the parties you're contracting with, which we're all familiar with because you, you know, as L1s and L2s, you have to do due diligence on other people in the chain. Um, you need to assess what they do to control affiliate fraud. So are they aware that there is affiliate fraud or they're not aware or etc.? You know, what is their sophistication level? Uh, assess their understanding of UK premium rate regulations. Um, and then agree with them, what do you do if you suspect that something has gone wrong? So establish escalation routes, how do you call, what do you do? Um, and then after you've kind of gone through this, kind of assess the risk of the partner. Do you have a partner who is 
you know, uh, very knowledgeable of UK premium rate, they're very knowledgeable of affiliate marketing fraud, they've got fraud departments, etc. Uh, you can work closely with them um, and they'll be helping you on the journey um, or are you going to be doing most of the work? And so, you know, just kind of assess what, uh, how much work you're going to have to do uh, to keep everything under control. In your contracts, um, it's advised to be as clear as you can in your contracts. Uh, a lot of affiliate networks, you know, Google AdWords, um, will, uh, that's their contract, you know, so you sign it or you don't do it. Uh, but you can in um, uh, 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 placement orders and in other things specify and clarify what it is you want to do. Um, or at least have a discussion with them and understand what it is that they're doing. So for example, so you should explicitly list wherever you can, this is what we want you to do, this is what we don't want you to do. We don't want you to do typo squatting, we don't want you to do, you know, such and so, but we are interested in banners, uh, but we're going to do the banners ourselves and you can only use our banners, whatever it is. So just be very clear on what it is they're allowed to do and what, what it is they're not allowed to do. Um, and you may even, you know, uh, uh, depending upon the circumstances, then say, if we haven't specifically agreed to something, then you're not allowed to do it. This will this will help later on if if, uh, if a problem happens. So then, uh, also state in your contracts uh, what happens if a fraud is detected or suspected, um, and try to assert your rights to withhold payments. You know, so especially if you're clear on this is what I want you to do, and anything that I haven't listed, I don't want you to do. Um, and then there's some sort of fraud that might might make it easier for you to withhold payment. Uh, the withholding payment is obviously important from a um, you don't want to fund criminals point of view. So it helps kind of the whole premium rate uh, industry um, if uh, there's no way of profiting as a affiliate, uh, if there's no way of profiting from it because the payments get withhold before they go on. Then you need to actively look for issues. So uh, monitor uh, your, uh, your affiliate advertising. Uh, do it regularly, systematically, document it. Um, Known entry routes is one thing, so that if you if you are buying redirects or if you are buying banner space on a specific uh, website, then um, by all means visit that website periodically, take screenshots of it, show that you know your banners are being displayed correctly, etc. Um, if you are in a blind network, and many uh, affiliate networks are blind, you know Google AdWords is blind for that matter, um, then it makes sense to um, act as if you're a user and go and search out typical users searching for your products and see if you can find uh, inappropriate ways of accessing your products. Um, again, you would want to do this regularly, systematically, you'd want to screenshot it. There may be advantages to having a third party company do it um, so that there's independence to it. Um, second thing you should do is analyze your data. Um, you'll be doing this anyways in order to manage your affiliate marketing campaigns. Uh, but, you know, look at conversion, conversion rates and ARPUs and complaints and refunds and go, you know, you come into the office one Monday morning and it's like, gosh, hits are very, very high, but conversion rates very low. Something's happened over the weekend. What is it? So in the same way you would do that, trying to maximize your affiliate <coughs> marketing campaigns, do the same thing and kind of look for fraud. So that if a campaign is remarkably profitable um, in the commercial world, that would be great. In the regulatory world, you just need to make sure that it's not remarkably profitable for the wrong reasons. Um, and then watch out for unusual consumer complaints. Um, with uh, the cons customer services uh, company that we work with uh, in their system, they flag a complaint, um, or a query, I should say. They flag a query if it's something unusual. If the person says something that, you know, people have the dog ate my homework sort of excuses all the time, but sometimes they come up with something which is like, I was doing X, Y, and Z, and then this happened. You're like, oh, that's kind of strange. So have your customer services people flag that, and then you can put that into the monitoring and specifically look for it and see if you can replicate it. Uh, then if things don't smell right, um, if you suspect that there might be fraud, then you might cap daily spending so you could keep it under control. You might, you would probably dive into the data and try to isolate what the unusual flows are. You get a, unusual, a number of unusual consumer complaints. Um, you might want to look up who was the affiliate network, who was the affiliate, have a conversation with the network, try to figure out what they were doing. Um, you might want to increase your monitoring, you might want to target your monitoring, um, and like I said, you might want to replicate these unusual complaints that, uh, that you've had. Then if something happens, um, and it's inevitable that something will happen, um, then uh, you need to clean up your messes. So 
capture evidence of the fraud, identify all of the affected users, uh, block that affiliate marketing route um, with your own systems, uh, contact the affiliate network, get them to block the routes, uh, emphasizing all along that if this is fraudulent traffic, then we, contractually you can't pay for it, um, regulatory-wise you can't pay for it, etc. You know, so that it's to everybody's advantage to stop doing this. Um, notify Phone Pay Plus, post details on the AIM early warning system. Uh, if it's a hacked site, report to the site owners and say, look, your site's been hacked and it's redirecting to ours, so please stop that. Um, refund the affected users um, and then watch out for this fraud in future. And um, when Phone Pay Plus was reading through the document that the Digital Marketing Working Group uh, uh, worked on, this was one of the areas that they were most interested in. So it's not only, you know, catching the fraud, obviously you've got to do that, but once it's caught, clean up the mess. If you, do, if you clean up the mess responsibly, then that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a long way forward. Guidance for the L1s. The L1s are um, not in contact with the, with the affiliate networks, they're not in contact with the affiliates. Um, uh, it's far, far more difficult for them to have visibility. Rather than having them reinvent the wheel and do everything that the L2 is doing, the L1s should just um, discuss with your L2s so that you know whether they're doing digital marketing, whether you're using affiliate marketing. Um, know that they know who their partners are, that basically they've done the due diligence. Um, assess the L2's level of understanding of the risks and of affiliate marketing and et cetera so that you know, you're comfortable that they know what they're doing. Um, review their monitoring to make sure that it looks like they're actually doing you know, the live monitoring they've got, uh, they're looking at unusual complaints. Um, and then if a mess does happen, you know, uh, help them ensure that it's cleaned up professionally and completely. So it's, it's fairly obvious, but basically just, your job is not to replicate what the L2s are doing, but just make sure that the L2s seem to understand what they need to do uh, and, uh, and are able to do it and are doing it. And I think that's all we wanted to say on the uh, best practice guide. Thank you. Are there any questions on not a debate, but are there any questions on the actual best practice documents? Is everyone comfortable? Not let's not discuss right now. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it doable? Is it too expensive? But does anyone have any questions about the specific tasks that are recommended? No. That's great. The spot bit, I'm afraid. The crunch question is: Where an L2 can be seen to have followed best practice, not just signed documents, where? The L2 has seen to have done best practice. What is Fabio Plus's view when the inevitable occasional mistake, but when the occasional affiliate fraud does happen and will happen? Right. Um, so I think Eric started off that nothing is kind of a panacea for all the ills. Um, so I'll start off by saying that um, obviously, even Ames guidance itself if I recall, states that about a third of the traffic going around on the web is fake. Um, so I think, Jeremy, you're right. You are going to get so things happening. People are always looking for a new way of doing something. Um, what I think we would comment is that in a market that's obviously still developing, and it's developing quite fast, there are always, are, there are always going to be approaches that you haven't seen before. Um, and so the reason I say that is because with any best practice, it is as good as what we knew about when we were writing it. Yep. Yeah. Um, I have to make a point as well, this is just very quickly, because I know that some people that attend tell me just in the past have got very upset about the idea that they should follow AIM guidance if they're not AIM members. Um, you know, I don't know if some people will remember this from kind of previous telemedias. Um, we would look at this as being a really significant contribution. Um, and so I think I can go a bit beyond what Eric suggested, that if you are following this, you are very, very significantly upping your game, basically. Um, I think it's important to stress that it's not a tick box exercise. Um, as I'm saying, things will change in a market like this all the time. There will be new techniques that people use, particularly if you're marketing using clients that are maybe two or three you know, ch links down a chain. Um, I think the important thing for us is that you do what's in the guidance, but you do it with sort of a constantly diligent approach. It's not about coming and saying, well, we ticked all these boxes, so that means we are now completely immune from any prosecution of any kind. It isn't that. There could be quite obvious problems that you're 
you're maybe not seeing because you're too busy taking the boxes. Um, in that case, we're going to look at things using the code, as we would always do, and we're going to make an assessment on a case-by-case -case basis using the code as to what you did and didn't do. So, I think our position is that by following the end practice, you are significantly increasing consumer safety, maybe even greatly doing it, and I think you're making a significant contribution to protecting yourselves as you protect consumers. Mm -hmm. What we cannot say is that you will always be immune from any kind of breach of the code in following it. Um, so hopefully, Jeremy, I've gone a little bit further than where it was, yeah. but what I don't want to suggest is that you somehow get 100% immunity, because in a market that develops like this, and in a market where people are paid by conversion, I think this is the other important thing, um, that there are some parts of this market where, of course, if you're working for John Lewis or Marks and Spencer or something, you're being paid by traffic going to the website, you're paid by hit. You know? So some of the techniques that people perhaps use in other arenas, are they're, being paid, they're being paid by conversion. Their incentive is to get that conversion by hook or by crook. Yes. Um, so if you like, our incentive when we do this has got to be to make sure that people don't take advantage of that. Um, I think a thing that I would stress, um, and I've talked with Eric about this, but I've talked with others about it as well, is it's not just what you do proactively, although that is a really big key to it. When you discover something, the really big thing is to clean up the mess and also not to pay people. Um, and this is the point I would stress again and again, because I have heard this from people, even now. Um, we still get complaints about affiliate marketing, whether it be affiliate or co-registration, which obviously I don't want to touch on so much, because that's a, that's a slightly different thing we're discussing. But we still do get complaints about this, and not huge, huge numbers, but very significant numbers of complaints about it. Um, and what we still hear from people is, well, we did everything we could, and how can we possibly stop this because they're getting paid for what they do? Now, I think we all know in this room, don't we, that no matter how many links down the value chain somebody is, you can stop them from being paid. Um, some people don't pay out immediately anyway for affiliate. They wait kind of however long to do it so you can stop what's going on. I realize, and everybody at the regulator realizes, that you, the reason there are affiliate networks, the reason you go down the chain, is because they don't want you to see everyone they're subcontracting to. There is a business reason for that, we accept that. But you don't need to know the names of the people that are ultimately doing your affiliate marketing to be able to say, this company here, X or Y or Z or whichever one, they're clearly responsible for traffic that's a problem, don't pay them. You know? Now, if you don't pay people, then they're unlikely to do things. Um, and that, for us, is one of the key things, that you take that kind of action straight away that you discover it. Um, and it's not a case of wringing hands and saying, well, we did all these checks and they still somehow got around this, what are we to do? Um, you know, that would be a key message I'd send out. I realize that there will be complications with all of this, but the earlier that you share those with Phone Pay Plus, the earlier we can be working with you to establish what's happening and what you're doing. Is um, it safe to share with you? I think it's safe to share in that we look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis. Where somebody's done all that they could reasonably have done, mm -hmm. and they've kept a really fresh, proactive view, they've not just ticked boxes, I think you've got to look at that and say, well, if somebody's done everything they could, you know, and this is a genuinely new technique that couldn't have been foreseen, mm -hmm. you know, then is there any real fairness or proportionality in investigating? Yes. On the other hand, there are a lot of people that will share things that are, known, that are techniques they could have known about and say we couldn't possibly have known about that. Um, now, as the regulator, we're not necessarily going to accept that, which is why I don't suggest that it's absolutely foolproof. Right. Just to, you know, just to follow the guy and sort of tick box. Yeah. All right. Now, that's really all that I have to say kind of from the stage. I'm quite happy to talk with people all day about this. But the only thing that I would suggest is while this greatly increases your chances of doing everything right, um, there are going to be situations where on a case by case basis we would still have an investigation. Right. right. So I think the safety is greatly like increased. Watch, yeah. Sounding like, therefore, watch. Be very careful, but there's no cast iron guarantees. I think it sounds like we just have to wait for precedence to be set. If people do this, well, let's ask Bart and Johnny, the, the, maybe Brian as well, how practical is implementing properly aim best practice? 
Is, well, it, very, is, it expense, is it too expensive? Does it make the UK commercials impossible? It is expensive. Um, the cost of compliance has been soaring in recent years and uh, the, the fact that we've got in our sector a lot of smaller companies um, with fairly limited resource if you're looking at covering all your bases. Um, however, th this code is, is doable, but what we need, I think we need more from the regulator from our side, or to be on our side, to help us police this, this, this space because it's, it, we don't have the resource to do that. If we've made all the checks to go into the marketplace to, to check out each provider, and, and when you come across a, a, a potentially dodgy partner, they stick out a mile so that you can, you, you can go onto the first page of this and, and you don't need to go any further because mm. you know if it kind of smells bad, it probably yeah, is probably bad. Is. Um, but we really do need, I think we need to up the cooperation with, with the regulator to make sure, and, and maybe with PhonePay Plus bringing in other agencies, because it's not a problem that just affects our sector, mm. it affects anyone who's looking to do any form of marketing online. Yes. You know, they're, they're exposed to this. And, and you know, we, we have rights to go and buy advertising, um, and we should be protected, but at the moment there's a feeling that, you know, we've done all we can to stop ourselves being mugged, but then when we do get mugged, we then get almost fined for being mugged. Yes, indeed. Um, and so, so I think there's, in recent times, I think there's a sort of, since last year, I think there's an enhanced spirit of cooperation. Um, but I think we can still do more and, and, yes. and, and, and see, see you know, what other agencies we can pull in. Yeah. And in positive terms, Johnny, and I'm not suggesting we as a regulator would offer to do this ourselves, but is there a way of perhaps sharing the information about the people who smell bad? Yeah, well, we, we, there's the early warning system, which is, okay, it's still in its early stages. I mean, are you talking about sharing it directly? or I mean, um, there's already I think sort what of I'm doing is, I mean, you're right, the early warning system will make a very positive contribution to it. But I think what I'm hearing is that where you discover people who are obviously going to damage everybody's reputation, the quicker that everybody with the regulation knows about that, mm -hmm. the better. You did discuss that in the a working group, yeah. and the view was there's too many legal legal issues if we were to start to bad mouth publicly companies, they could come after yeah. us for defamation. But even though there are particular characteristics, you see, Johnny, you talked about not needing to go further because something just smells wrong the mm -hmm. minute you're there. Without them having to necessarily name or defame companies, is there a way of, is there a way of saying there are certain things that look bad? If you perhaps don't know this, this is what you need to be looking for. Are there characteristics we can give? Um, and in that way, you're not saying don't do business with anyone. You're saying be very wary of anybody with these particular characteristics. <laughs> Now that's an open question. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Well, Mark, I, I, yes, I, th I think you're right. You can say, here is a new technique um, which we don't like, or here's something which smelled, uh, which, which doesn't smell right, and here's an example of it in the wild. And you don't take off the logo of the company. But it is a true example. And you're not saying that they're blacklisted. You're just saying, here's something which is, uh, uh, which is problematic, and we've decided that we don't want to go down this route, and here's an example of what it looks like. So I think, I think there are ways of kind of skirting it, but, um, but there, then there's different levels. It's not only your partner, but then uh, the network, but then they get traffic from affiliates who get traffic from affiliates who get traffic from affiliates. And so sometimes it's five steps removed, 20 steps removed, but still once you, if you can recognize it and screenshot it and say, this is, this is an example of bad practice. Yeah. Yeah. Now with something like that, it's very hard to block them because they change their name and they move around to different yeah. affiliate networks but at least you can watch out for it. Now you know what to look for. Yeah. I think it's the, it, you're absolutely right. It's the nest, I call them nested journeys where you've got an affiliate network nested under another affiliate network. That's, that's where the fraudsters bury themselves quite deep for obvious reasons. But from, from a monitoring perspective, we see we must do five, 600 consumer journeys from affiliate banners a week, maybe a bit more these days. We see a, I don't, we see no, probably one in 500 is problematic now. 18 months ago, I would say one in 20 journeys was non compliant. So I think the industry has done a bloody good job, considering I think, frankly, the affiliates are cleverer than we are. Um, I, th I think, I think part of that is, is that 18 months ago, everyone pulled out of the affiliate market. True. market. So, so, you know, there's, there's, few people going back in now on a very sort of, you know, toe in the water exactly. to see, see how it goes. But it's looking pretty um, safe. I mean, as I say, one in 500 
is not bad. Yeah, but <coughs> what Johnny is saying, uh, in our particular case, we're only running with direct traffic where we know that yes. the first partners are the lowest risk of traffic, which results in uh, lower volumes and uh, in the end uh, less problems. So it's so What's your perspective, Bart, then? On, are you prepared to open the tap up a bit more? Yeah, so the question that I have for Mark is, you mentioned that what uh, should be, we should reasonably be, uh, reasonably be aware of, but how can we know what we need to be aware of from, from your perspective? I think that this is one of the big pre What you end up talking about is that sort of idiotic phrase, Donald Rumsfeld, which yes, is I'm just thinking that, exactly that, so the unknown unknowns. Um, yeah. I think this is the, the issue is that what, what it more is about is we don't want to be in a position where we say, if you've ticked all these boxes, then if there's something else that happened because it wasn't something, we, it, because it wasn't a box we asked you to tick, you don't need to notice it. Um, I think where it's obvious that you've kind of done all the checks that you might have done and somebody has genuinely got a technique that no one's seen before, I think that is a very different it's case. A technique, Mark. I so it's, it's, a it's a rogue in a oh, sure. it's a rogue in some network yeah. 3D has popped up one day. Well, okay, yeah. But if somebody's got some, if somebody has managed to pop up where we didn't expect them, if somebody has got something that they're doing that we, you know, it's a characteristic we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. I think that's different from something that actually it might have been reasonable to know about. Um, and you'd be surprised. I think the problem is that I'm in a room with people where a lot of people are really thinking this out in a great deal of detail mm -hmm. because these are actually the people who want to do it right. Um, what we are still seeing is people who are coming along and saying, well, how could we have known about this? And we're saying, well, do you know what? It was glaring in front of you. you, know, you know, did, you, did it not occur to you as a business that you're getting magnificent traffic from over here? You know? Now, I realize that that's a cause for celebration, but as a business, surely you want to know either, is that traffic legitimate? In which case I want somebody to do me a lot more of that traffic. Or there might be a reason for this that's not so good, Indeed. in which case I want to stop it. And you would be amazed that we're still guessing this. You know? Even in a room full of people who are trying to sort of control this to the nth degree. Yeah. You know? And so but that's what I'm really saying, is that when, if you're following the end guidance, you are making a very significant contribution to your own safety and that of consumers, because you're, you're thinking about all the processes that might, you, know, you might need to go through you're thinking about how to control things. If there's genuinely something that you couldn't have known, there's genuinely something you couldn't have known. Mm. What we do want, though, is just to reflect that and make sure everybody else knows about it's it. It's not genuinely known, it. is it? it, it's, so. it the issue isn't about knowing about a technique. It's, it's did capturing. you, at that moment in time, yeah, go to a particular consumer point uh -huh. at a certain time of day yeah. where this rogue had swapped what he was doing with something else? Yeah, yeah. Well, Jeremy, Jeremy, there might be another way of looking at it, which is that, um, as I mentioned, PPP's biggest feedback on the digital marketing guidance was about the cleaning up the messes. Yep. And I think it kind of comes down to the, the fine and the track to breaches is the insult on top of the injury. And so we had a client recently who had uh, 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 an affiliate multiple levels deep, did some pretty horrendous stuff. Uh, we caught it very quickly. We told PhonePay Plus. We refunded everybody. There's still a lot of work now explaining to PhonePay Plus what we did, how we caught it. We caught it within a couple of hours. How did we refund everybody? How are we going to prevent it in the future? So um, hopefully this client is not going to get a breach letter, is not going to get a fine. So you know we don't have the insult on top of the injury, but there's still a phenomenal amount of effort to clean it up. And this was caught within a couple of hours um, and stopped and the person hasn't been paid. If you've had something that's run for a month, and you haven't caught it, well then you're going to have to do a lot Indeed. more work um, explaining to PhonePay Plus why um, they shouldn't give you a track two breach letter. So I think you were talking about we're going to have to wait for precedences um, to see, you know, uh, and PhonePay Plus will have to start getting comfortable with the process mm. um, so that if you get a routine heinous breach but you catch it quickly, um, the, uh, the affiliate isn't paid and everybody gets refunded, um, <coughs> then it's fairly quick to solve. Yeah. That's, that's the world I'd love to get to. So well, what you're saying, Eric, is that if, uh, if we can get to a sort of standard where we send uh, information in case of a, a breach, the available, uh, if we can 
work with Focal Plus towards a document of some sort that if we fill in all the all the blanks with all the right information and the proof, of course, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. If, if that's yeah. I think it's that, and it's also this this thing that Eric alluded to, Jeremy. And, you know, I mean, you know, you must are kind of for a living as well. And I think it's the difference, as you say, you cannot necessarily be everywhere that somebody's doing something at any time. But I think there's a big difference between discovering it within 24 hours and saying, right, we've got this now, here indeed. it is. And then coming along a month later and saying, oh, there's the most horrendous thing. You yes, know, there was all this yes. money we made and we didn't realize. And it's only just now we found out that there's a problem. I think the key word, uh, therefore, people alluding to is proactive. So I think that's yeah, I think as well. I mean, Eric mentioned um, if, you, if, you, if you've got tracking tools that monitor your traffic, in, in real time, um, if you've got a dodgy affiliate somewhere down the chain, you'll see it. You'll, you'll see it straight yeah. away. Yeah. Yeah. And and if you can't jump on that and, and as Eric says, clean up the mess, yeah. um, then you really shouldn't be in the game. To be fair, but, but, but it does. Sorry, it does bring another issue: is how far down that line do we or are we expected to monitor, and and and, and how effectively can we? The further you go, as you know, the harder it is to find the source. So. This is it's kind of, you know, you, you may not be able to answer the question, but where, do we, you know, where would you draw the line in saying, well, there's maybe five stages there that... I think it's something. I think this is actually, it's almost the thing that I can't answer, but we, mm -hmm. but, but we continue to consider it. Because I think the problem is that when you go down to a certain level of affiliate marketing, it stops being what I would call a tree. You're, you're not passing down and branching out so much as it's becoming a crisscross. Because actually some of the affiliates are actually then marketing with each other to yep, go back. Yep. You know? So you've got several different sort of flows. Rather than being able to say, well, you start here, you go here, and then you're splitting off and splitting off. You've actually got I think you're talking about an attribute of co-reg rather than blind affiliate well, networks. Well, yes. Co -reg, they, they yeah. do I think with co-reg, there's, yes, there's, but there's a lot of different routes that necessarily yes. go back. Um, I think one of the things we'd be more interested to know is how many steps down the chain do you go for this to cease to be worth mm. anybody's time? Because I realize that with affiliate marketing, there is an extremely low sort of setup cost, if you like, and kind of on cost to it. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons there can be this many links in the chain. But can you potentially go sort of hundreds of steps down the chain and still make some kind of money out of it? Or how many steps does it cease to actually be profitable and worth anybody's time to subcontract further? It just depends where you're going to start from, really. I mean, if you go um, take, to, I don't know, type of squatting or something, yeah. you, you, you hit a page and, um, and, and you, you have a banner that's been placed on that page. Yeah. But would the, the banner isn't misleading. Oh. Your lander is not misleading. Yeah. But if that page was set up to say not even look like the page it was looking to yeah. emulate, or, oh. or that, you know, say it was Google beginning passing with a six off. or something, passing off, yeah. yeah. Um, is the user then being misled? If you know, it's like if you if you want to watch ITV and you miss the button, you hit Channel Four, but then you see on Channel Four, oh, actually, that's a better program on there. I'll I'll stick with this one. So, is there in, in that instance, is this a, you know maybe we start the debate? Is is this a point of misleading the user? Because surely at that stage they would just go, no, I didn't want this site. Go back and type Google in problem. So I mean, that's only say three steps away. Uh, and then this is actually one that I've. <coughs> Uh, some monitoring that uh, FilmPay have given us recently, and this is one of the things that has come up. So I've bounced that back to Chris Bennett, uh -huh. and Chris is, he's not sure, uh, from what I can Could tell Could you give yet. us a bit more for flavor on that one, Brian? Sorry, yeah, it was, it was, it was essentially type of squatting. So type, right. uh, any, any, any time that, um, when we started affiliate marketing, we were getting type of squat traffic, yeah. and straight away we got hit with, you know, that was, that, that's passing off as YouTube, YouTube type stuff. Uh, and straight off, you know, that's misleading, don't do it. And that's built into the... Was the, it visually like YouTube? It was, yeah, and this is three, four years ago. Uh, yeah. um, so that's, that's stitched into the code of practice, you know, it was one of the things to, you know, don't allow uh, type of squatting. But it's just recently come up that somebody's missed out <coughs> Google, but it just goes straight onto an affiliate pre-lander that doesn't look anything like Google or is not trying to emulate it. So, and I discussed this with, uh, with you last night, Jeremy. Yeah, and, uh, that's not misleading. Yeah, it's not misleading. But again, I'd like to get that steer from yeah. phone pay and then to be well, able to share it with. I think the group. that's the. You see, to go back to Joy's point, which I think links into yours, mind. If you turn on, if you want ITV and you get Channel 4, and it's obvious you've got Channel 4, 
I think there's a different level from if you turn on and it's like Channel 4's version of the X Factor. Exactly. And actually, you think you're watching ITV for 20-odd exactly. minutes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think there has to be different levels of granularity. Here. Brian, I'll, I can't comment on something individual that Chris is still considering. No, 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 no. no but exactly. I would say that much, that there are different levels always with these things. Yeah, and I suppose just what we're looking for is yeah. kind of um, to be able to get a, a consistent message out yeah. from I think you there guys. There def definitely needs to be a differentiation between typo squatting and passing off. And yeah. the issue is passing yeah. off, not typo yeah, yeah. squatting. I think, I think also, so. obviously, if you find your banner on a typo squatting page, your, your um, IO agreement should actually forbid you being on there and, yeah. and you yeah. can you can yeah. rightly yeah. Um, not pay for that traffic yeah. but you know it can get out there and and you know we monitor all sort of all, all the obvious type of squatting sites on a regular basis um, and, and and we have third-party companies that do that as well yeah. um, but you know in, in those instances where one isn't passing off and you find a, a banner on there that's you know that that's compliant and, and the step from there is compliant um, you know it, it there there is a question whether that's actually misleading anybody if there, there's, a, there's another angle here, which is one, if um, the person by accident turns to Channel 4 and they meant to go to ITV and they like the program and they watch it, then they're not going to complain and there was no consumer harm. So there's kind of two tracks here of where did this case come from? Did it come from 40 people were complaining about the same thing and they felt misled? Or did the case come from somebody did monitoring and decided that this was misleading and therefore there was harm? And so it kind of comes back to the emergency procedures which were done last year. I think one of the things that got a lot of people's backs up was that there was no consumer harm, but there was an emergency procedure. So I think, I think you're now in the area of a lot of the guidance is, you know, there has been harm. It's pretty clear that there's been harm. Um, have you cleaned it up? But then you're in a different world of, well, is this sharp practice? Is this sharp practice over the line? Is anybody being harmed about it? Is anybody being complaining about it? You know, are you getting an unfair advantage or not? So, so I think that there's, there, there's two aspects here, you know, to kind of keep in mind. But I, I agree with your point, you know, the difference between type of squatting and passing off. Um, but I think this then comes into, this is kind of one of the dangers of monitoring, is then as you go through and you're looking for these um, uh, unsavory journeys, deciding, well, Okay, I feel a little bit uncomfortable about somebody typing in misspelling Google and ending up on my site, but is this really a problem or not? So, um, but I, I don't know what Phone Plus's view on that is, you know, because the, the code says, thou shalt not mislead. So, um, so I'm not sure how, that's, how that works in practice. Well, I think the only thing, um, I can't sort of say whether it does or doesn't mislead according to the code, not just at this moment kind of on this, yeah. you know, platform, but... What I would say is, as I said, is there's different levels of granularity to something like that. If somebody's mistyping Google and they're up on your site and your site's got all of the kind of stuff it needs, yeah, then the consumer, the consumers, it's irritating and the consumer isn't where they want to be and they've been misled into going there. But they've got sort of everything that they clearly need. You know, they're not, they're less likely to make a purchase if all of your pricing information is as it should be and all of your service information. That's a very different proposition to being told you're on Facebook and actually enter this competition and it looks like Facebook's coloration and page layout and, you know, yep, and font yeah, and all of this. Yeah. Because the consumer actually genuinely believes at this point they're on Facebook. Yeah. Now there are, you know, so what I suppose I'm saying is there's misleading and there's misleading. Yeah. So with everything that we would look at, you always look not just at what the breach, you know, whether there's a breach, but what the breach is, the strength of it. Yeah. And I think the other point I would make before we move, move too far away from it is I can think of plenty of people in the room who have contacted us in the past and said, look, our charging platform, something's happened to us. Yeah. And we've billed however many consumers by mistake and we're going to refund them and we're going to fix what's gone wrong. And as long as we know that and we know that no profit is being made, that's not to say that there isn't a breach of our code. Of course, there is a technical breach of our code and that you should not charge people. But we look at the situation that that involves. If, if actually no lasting or lingering harm is occurring, I can think of plenty of occurrences, and probably some of the people in this room who, I want, you know, who have spoken to me can, where we haven't been taken that any further. Mm -hmm. you know? Now, this is something that through increments, we should be able to reach with affiliate marketing. But at the moment, it is a fast developing market where we still are not quite sure of you know, every single occurrence. I don't see this fast developing. I see this as people pulled back big time yeah. 18 months ago. Oh. 
15 months ago. And really the question is, do people feel brave enough to step back in? How, how deep are you prepared to go back into the sea? If you're a coward, you stay out of the sea until you see somebody swim out a bit for three months. They don't get eaten by sharks, and then you're going to join the water. But you've lost three months of opportunity. Now, who feels brave enough to at least go in up to their, up to their waist? So uh, let's uh, then have, I think, to the uh, audience here. Who, let's get a temperature feel for how deep into the sea people are prepared to go at the moment. So maybe, Rogue Games, do you want to comment? Um, we're, we're Warren Schneebach's in, in the middle of step up, um, but we're very much looking at it now, and this is you know, one of the reasons for it, for this debate. And uh, from some of the that we've got in touch with, it does seem to be a different scenario to what we saw uh, 18 minutes ago. Yeah. I think some of the, you know, Johnny, as you say, some of the issues that were very clear and very blatant, I think they've, from what we see, they've gone away. So, what's your we're kind of view. Watching go, up to, go up to your knees or up to your waist. I think, you know, everything goes well when we look to get back into it. Right. But as I was saying, I think some of the points we made today about, you know, we're very nervous about something going wrong and yes. then getting sort of twin bricks down. Uh -huh. and I think that's, that's a real issue, really. That's, that's the new. I think it was one of the, one of the, I think Eric mentioned earlier um, that, you know, with any new campaign, you should put caps on. Um, yep. So you, you you limit your exposure to um, any new affiliate in a network. Uh, Capital. Yeah, I mean you, you could you not could, yeah. in the network. Um, it depends if it's a new network or yeah. the cap on the network. Yeah. But um, uh, you know whether it's CPL or CPA, you can still apply caps, um, and and that that's a good way of regulating any new uh, new partner. And then you can proceed. You know, go up to your mm. ankles, up to your knees, and you know, mm. I think it'd be reckless to dive straight in. The only thing that I'd say is that uh, the world's very diverse and there are some affiliate networks who won't accept caps. They say, you either buy the traffic or your competitor will. So, do you want it? <clears throat> you know, and so, so you then have to take a risk. And so, so I just, I wouldn't want, you know, people to take away that, oh, caps then, if you don't do caps, you've done something wrong. Because in some environments, you can't have caps. In some environments, you can't have I caps. Disagree. So, I disagree. I, I would um, <coughs> actually say, if a partner didn't want to apply a cap that was reasonable, then there's probably some dodgy reason behind that. A lot of it is, you know, they'll have a set pre-lander, and let's say they're using previous winners, they don't want to change the previous winners, and it's essentially a lot of them are lazy, I think. Yeah. And they don't want to kind of go, well, this is this company's previous winners, and I have to switch over to something else. If they can do a very generic page, they probably will be more uh, amenable to doing it. Um, I, I, th I think that the point is that caps are one way of controlling it. You can go in with an affiliate network with no caps, but then you should counterbalance it perhaps with more monitoring, you should counterbalance it with slower payment terms, you should counterbalance it with something. So all these things are, there's no combination which will protect you from phone pay plus, and therefore every combination is equally valid, if that makes sense. Yeah. As long as at the end of the day, you can prove that um, uh, you were able to clean up the consumer harm, um, and that it's not gonna happen again. And uh, you know, when if you go to a tribunal, the tribunal also looks at bringing the industry into disrepute. You know, so as long as you can, whatever strategy you had, we're able to cover these things. So I, 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 you don't want to use caps. That's fine. I know other, or you only want to use caps. That's fine. I know other people who don't use caps, but I think that what they're doing is safe one, enough. One thing as well is <coughs> affiliates will try and play uh, providers off each other, and will say, well. Xamarin will, will, will allow this, or SB7 will allow this, or Xamarin will pay that. Um, I think what's happened over the last uh, 16 months, and probably one of the reasons, Jeremy, why we're not finding as many rogue um, customer journeys is because as a group we're talking and discussing things yeah. quite openly exactly. with each other. So it's a case that Johnny could pick up the phone to me and go, well, I think we've been shaken down here. Um, yeah. Are you guys doing this? And, if they find out that, you know, as a group we, we all talk to each other, they're less likely to, yeah. to, to do anything. And I, I think what's happened as well is that there's kind of a more, there's an acceptance from affiliates that in the UK market there's, you know, a, a line and, and you can't cross it. It's, it's almost like... It kind of feels as though 18 months ago our industry was quite naive and it was severely hit by 
affiliate fraud. Yeah. It happened to be the naive industry got beaten up by its regulator. But I think, as you were saying, the industry seems to have wised up big yeah. time, it's got much more mature about it. And the output of which is, particularly in the adult sector, where we have a lot of technology at the moment deployed to automate the discovery of this stuff, the adult sector, from a affiliate perspective, is squeaky clean. And that's a sector that you would have expected historically to be problematic. But what's your, you know, you, you've launched in the UK Playbay, you buy your own traffic, you buy direct traffic only, what's your risk appetite to move towards blind networks? Uh, yeah, I would love to talk about uh, the, the, the follow-up, cleaning up the mess, uh, make a good plan with Marco, one of his colleagues, uh, set that first and when that's ready and uh, I, I can understand you're not going to give me any certainties but at least makes me a little bit more secure and it might definitely be an option to to start slowly uh, yeah. and try, try a little bit more. I think, that if, I think that Bart would apply to yourself and anybody else in the room. If it's about starting slowly and working on a plan, then we'd be happy to sit with people individually or kind of collectively in some, you know, where it's appropriate to do, it, do that. And you're right, it's not going to give you absolute certainty, but I think it will give you a great deal more certainty than potentially you had 18 months ago or even just as you're thinking about getting back into it. Ultimately, the other comment that I'd make is what I've heard from Eric and Johnny and Brian over there. It's almost the classic example of what we want from outcomes-based regulation. That you obviously you want to kind of like draw clear lines, but obviously as well there are more than one, there's more than one way of achieving the same yes. objective, and we would want a system that allowed people to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Further comments from the field, from. The audience, what's people's risk appetite currently in the UK? Can we have a somebody perhaps who's not currently using blind networks in the UK? Can we have some comments on that? I think there's business requirements where we need to go back into the market because we've had 15 months, 16 months of changing our businesses, increasing our costs hugely to self-regulated serving that If we don't go out there and start buying traffic, then the business is quite functional. Uh, just not sustainable. Uh, but if we do the right safe way, then we've got opportunities to start too. We shouldn't be regulating that. We should be responsible for what we do. But there's got to be an understanding that as much best practice we put in place, if some, somebody comes along and tweets that, or does something that you know, us, and then we get slammed by, by the regulator as well. So oh, look at what we've done for the last 15, 16 months to get to this place. And all of a sudden, something you know, over an hour, two hours a day, whatever, makes just mess up everything. It's like we've got to, it's got to be a fair approach for us to take, for us to be as promoted to be confident to go back out into the market, start, yeah. and then, you know, spend uh, generating uh, more business for, for, for ourselves, but also be, you know, being responsible. Yeah. Well. I was just wondering whether, from Tech Lab, you're prepared to make comments. So you're not currently in the UK. What does the UK look like? Compared to your other markets, does the UK look scary? Does it look? Yeah, it's probably too early for us to say something. Uh, this is this too weak. Not really start to do Yeah. If I have to be honest, we were expecting a little bit more. I mean, it's regulated, but it's not absolutely clear. Yeah. No. It does be a little bit more. Because in some other countries that we expect that they are less regulated, they are, but they are a little bit more. Okay. This is the first sensation we have in this That's It's so often the demand. I remember during the development of the 12th Code, there was the do people want prescriptive regulation or do they want principles based regulation? And for a lot of people entering a market, a prescriptive code of practice is actually quite convenient because it's in black and white what you can and can't do. The reality of the UK is it's principles based, which has upsides, but it also has downsides. And the downsides of the UK is it's not black, white, good, bad. As you're, as you're hearing today, there are no certainties in the UK. It's a matter of understanding the flow, <laughs> the current in the sea. And that takes a bit of time and experience. Any other comments from people who are? not currently using blind networks in the UK, but perhaps are using blind networks elsewhere. Nope. 
Jeremy, if I could just add in that um, <coughs> affiliate marketing isn't on or off, I'm doing it or not. There's a very, very wide off, range yes. of it. You yeah. can uh, contract with networks who only have relationships with specific websites. Indeed. But they don't buy affiliate traffic from other affiliates. Indeed. You can create your own banners and say you can only use my banners. You can have them create banners, but you approve it. So there, there's there's many, many, many different techniques. I ought to really precede. I've, when I've been using the word affiliate networks, I mean blind affiliate networks. <coughs> okay, I but, but there's flavors okay. of blind. Yeah, but even within blind, you can be buy, yes, buying indeed. redirects. You could be indeed. buying pre-lenders. You can, you know, there's lots of things. So I think it's some things are more risky than others. If you're going to take the more risky ones, just realize that you've got to have a very sharp on the ball compliance department who is able to provide phenomenal amounts of information to PhonePay Plus to uh, swage any concerns that they might have had that um, you know uh, the, the criminals have profited by it, you've profited by it, etc. Yeah. And that you know uh, you weren't your eye on the ball. But um, there are lesser forms of affiliate marketing, you know, even on blind networks where um, uh, there's much less risk of something to happen and it would be far easier to prove that you caught it quickly. So again, you know, if if it was a uh, if it was a non-blind network, because you you know you, you do have non-blind affiliate networks, then you know what the sites are that they're advertising yes. on, and you have a third party monitor them, then it's very unlikely anything's going to happen. Indeed. And if you did, you could say, look, this is every single day Indeed. we're going to all twenty sites. Um, we caught this thing. So it's 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 a dial. It's not an on-off. No, it feels a bit like actually like a. When you make an investment decision, your advisor will ask you what risk profile you're prepared to have. And it feels a bit like that topic. So it feels like the answer is, if you want, whilst it's not yet proven as to what the regulator will do, it sounds though a cautious, set the dial to caution. Yeah, to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Turn it up a bit, yep. see what happens. Turn it up a bit more, <laughs> whoops, Mopi Plus is getting excited turn it back down again. That's what it's feeling like. It doesn't feel like a on, off, in, out. It feels like gently turning taps up. I would even go this way. Once you turn it up, when something happens, you yep. now have a message you have to clean up. Indeed. And it's going to take a phenomenal amount of effort. We had this one client, I won't go into the details, and it was a heinous form of uh, dodgy affiliate marketing. It was caught within hours. Still, endless meetings. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're getting a, a, a section 4.2.3 letter from PPP about it uh, when I get back, um, and so there's just a lot of work yep. to sort this thing out. Yep. Um, so even if it doesn't so, go to a track two, you well, still well exactly exactly. So the, the goal now work. is so that it doesn't turn into a track two yep. or even a track one. But the point is that um, it was a pretty heinous problem. Um, and the dial was set up. So it's not like you can turn the dial up, oh, PPP seems to be getting a little bit too much attention, let's tire it down. What happens is you turn the dial up, and then an explosion. Boom, <laughs> you now have six months worth of work to do to yep. clean this mess up. Yep. We get a lot of analogies here. So we're talking about an oil tanker spillage <laughs> after mixing metaphors. Right, we've got another five minutes. Yeah, uh, I think that's, that's a good point that Eric raised there. Do you think there in the future is a way to make cleaning up the mess a little bit easier, smaller? Well, do you think this was actually, people? yeah. I was going to add that, that at the moment, because people are sort of stepping back in, and obviously this is really the first time we've seen this sort of thing since the emergency procedures. Um, so I think invariably we need to get, and we will get, some better and more efficient, I guess, is probably, you know, at how we deal with these things and what information we expect. Because I think there can be a temptation, um, and this is just among colleagues where people are perhaps used to doing things as part of a process for investigating anything, mm -hmm. and they will maybe ask for information that isn't so relevant, or they won't ask the question that if they ask that, mm -hmm. it would save you two, three weeks worth of work. You know? Now, invariably, we can get better at that, and we will do. Yeah. Is that so, a priority for folks at the moment? I think it has to be a priority to get better at because it doesn't do us any favours either. No, no it's draining your resources. This is well. exactly yeah. it, it drains our resources as well to, to do this. So, yeah. okay. Okay. Well, maybe we need a session, separate session in between industry and regulator, which is efficient cleaning up the mess. What process? Because I do think some of the guys on your side don't really understand quite yet. I think as a, an education journey, you're going to have to take back in to make sure they understand the type of things that need to be done cleaning up on a, a post-affiliate mess is different from a standard investigation which needs A, B, C, D, F, G. 
So you know, that's something we can get done. I think something else that, just from speaking to people last night as well, that we're all looking for is just <clears throat> consistency as well of mm. application of rules. And there doesn't seem to be that at the moment. Uh, I suppose there's over to you, Mark, again. Um, is there anything the film pay are doing really to kind of make rules consistent and application of rules consistent? Because, you know, you, you can get compliance advice from person A and then it just gets overruled by person B, you know, a month later or something like that. And as industry, it's, it's very difficult to know where you stand in, in, in those instances. Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose I can only broadly say that we really, sh you know, we would, we would want compliance advice to be consistent. We, we wouldn't want a situation where things are being overridden. Um, and uh, I, know, I think from my point of view, we are learning about this as well. So just as you guys are kind of going into the water and seeing how this happens, we are learning, if you like, as the lifeguard to see where the danger signs are. Um, now, as we do that, there is going to be potentially a little bit more kind of asked for in terms of mm. you know, looking at complaints. Um, but we will get better at this. And of course, what we want to do is apply things consistently. We don't want to be giving different messages mm. to different people. Mm. But this, this, work, this kind of work is nothing to do with consumer complaints. Because this stuff, as you found, as you discovered, the thing you were a victim of yeah. is two hours. You've got a few hours. It's not going to be the year, average 45 days uh, of pro yeah. Well, there, yeah. there aren't 45 days worth of serious problems in this business. There yeah. might be four hours of yeah. serious harm in this business. No. But it doesn't last long enough for it to come onto your radar. Yeah. yeah. I mean, albeit, I mean, as I said, I will add that we still do get some significant numbers of complaints, but nothing, you know, not where we were last no, year. No. Um, but you're right, it can be discovered through sources of monitoring, and it can even be discovered, of course, when somebody comes to us and says, look, we Indeed. had four hours of this, we Indeed. found it. What do we now do to clear it up? Indeed. Um, I think as we go forward, we're going to want to deal with all of those in the way in which they deserve, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, people are coming to you, you know, and there's a genuine effort. It's not about, I made my money and now I can report it. You know? I think we want to help that get cleaned up and make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah.